Good day, everybody, and afternoon. Um, I know you are about to join us here, um, so we'll give this some time. But for the early risers, thank you very much for coming on board early. Um, there is more and more people coming in. We're just over 100 already right now. So if you guys want to drop into the chat and just let us know that you can hear me and hear us and see our screens, that would be great. Look at that. I see the perfect. I see the first answer here. Someone can hear us. Tim Kelly, loud and clear. Nice. Marvin, Colin Smith. Colin Smith, good to see you here. Um, great to have you. Um, yeah, where are you guys all from? Lee Hart. Good to see you here as well, Lee. Who else do we have here? Ron Cron from Rivers, Manitoba. I do believe I know Mr. Cron as well and have met him in the past. So it's good to see you here. Um, Brody Nesterich, Innisville, Alberta, Central Illinois. Welcome to the people from south of the border. A um, bit warmer there. You guys must go almost into planting already. So that's exciting. Um, Kitchener, Ontario. Holy, Dinah is all over the place. Um, Alberta. Who else do we have here? Okay, we've got two minutes left. Southwest Ontario, Ian Pritchard, Jason Friesen. That name rings a bell as well. Good to have you here. Um, yeah, just to let everybody know, so you already know how the chat function works, so this is great. Um, there you can chat back and forth, etc. I want to draw your attention also to the a bit more to the right of the chat, it says questions. So if you have any questions during um, this session, please drop them in and say ask a new question and you drop it in. And then you can actually upvote it. So there's that many people in this um, webinar right now that we will have to vote on which questions we can actually answer um, during this session. And then we're going to have polls as well. So for the polls, you will see, um, you will just go in and you say, um, they're going to pop up and we're going to publish them and say, uh, yeah, we want to hear a little bit on what you think. So we are at 140 people, um, which is amazing. Um, who is there? Anita, South, South Dakota. Cool. Hey, Walter. Nice meeting you. Um, yeah, we had actually over 500 registrants. So we'll see how many people um, will show up on time um, and uh, we get this webinar started. It's very exciting to have that many people um, joining us. However, we are going to talk about something very important. So I think it will... Someone from Belgium as well, Lucas Geschkere. Good to have you here. I'm Wade Fisher from Saskatchewan. Um, Cool. Okay, we are one minute away. Um, I hope everybody was on time and didn't miss the time change is happening as well. We are at 5.30, everyone. Perfect. I am Swiss myself, by the way, so I have to um, start this on the dot. Um, it is such a pleasure having you guys here. Um, I am the co-founder and COO of AgVisor Pro. Um, I'm going to be running a bit the technical um, stuff behind the scenes. You guys will also see Charles Chavez in the chat. Um, he'll be looking after the chat and um, answer any questions if you have there. Um, and yeah, just some housekeeping rules. So first of all, chat, use that to like tell, tell us from where you are and uh, what you want to look for, etc. cetera. Um, Charles just answered there and said like he's, he's going to be there. More importantly though are questions. There is a tab on the right hand side where there's questions. You can post those questions. You can say like, hey, I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask this to the panelists. You can upvote it. Um, maybe if someone types in a question there and we can see how this is going to work and upvote it. And then the last thing as well is we're going to have polls. Within those polls, you can say, um, um, 
what you actually think. So we're going to um, publish those once they come around. Without further ado, then, I am super excited um, to host this webinar today. This is one of many, um, a lot of them. And I would like you to introduce Mr. Robert Syke, um, the MC for today. Um, Rob, take it away. Thanks very much. We are rising like crazy when it comes to how many people we already have in our chat here and are interacting. So take it away. The pressure is on, my friend. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. And I'm seeing from the names on the screen lots of people that I know. Kent Olson, how you doing, buddy? Robert Wolf, uh, great to see everybody here. This is our first AgVisor Pro uh, seminar that we're running. We intend on running many of these. AgVisor Pro is building a, ch a connectivity channel for agriculture. Uh, we believe one of the pinch points in farming across the planet is the right, uh, right advice from the right expert at the right time. So at AgVisor Pro, we have independent experts and we also have tech direct partners, which would include people like MNP and the team there and Dean Klippenstein, who's our guest speaker for tonight. We also have Exceed Grain Marketing as a tech, tech direct partner and Derek Squire is with us. And then we have Global Ag Risk Solutions, who's also a tech direct partner with Travis Weens. Any of these tech direct partners are able to be contacted for 100% free on the AgVisor Pro application. And we'll tell you how to get uh, that done later on. Uh, the polls were already mentioned. We're gonna be introducing a poll before each speaker. It's not our intent to, uh, to uh, preach, uh, rather to do a checkup. Uh, as farmers are getting ready for this extraordinary year with, uh, with commodity prices being where they're at, you know, if mother nature cooperates and we can get a half decent crop, the numbers are penciling out quite nicely. Stick around to the end, and at the end, we've got a special uh, special something for you at the end of the seminar. We're up to 200 people already uh, on the webinar. Without further ado, I'm going to invite each of our guest speakers to join us, beginning with Dean Klippenstein uh, to tell us a little bit about, sorry, Travis Weens. Travis Weens to tell us a little bit about himself, and then we'll go to Derek Squire and, and Dean Klippenstein. Uh, my bad. So, uh, Travis, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll bring up Derek. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Rob. So, my name's Travis Weens, and I have a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the University of Saskatchewan. I live about half hour south of Regina, and I'm co-owner of a consulting business and a Pioneer Hybrid Agency. And today, I'm excited to be here wearing my Global Agris cap. Well, we're going to hear a lot about you because a combination of government and uh, private insurance really is a risk mitigation strategy. And Derek Squire is with us. Him and I go way back. Derek, welcome and tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Uh, yeah, so you and I are partners in, in AgriTrend and days gone by. And, and uh, so I've been doing the, the coaching business for about 15 years now total. I've been in the the grain and marketing business for about 28 years, so uh, extensive knowledge in uh, in international marketing and and uh, you know, markets around the world, and then also coaching here at home as well. So glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. It's great to have you with us, Derek. And then we're going to bring up uh, the magnanimous uh, Dean Klippenstein, who is going to lead us in our first uh, segment here. Dean, why don't you take uh, take it away with telling us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll drop this slide off, and the stage is yours, my friend, as we get into uh, your key area. Now, we're going to bring up a poll right now that deals with Dean's and MNP's area, which is around finance, and you're going to get a chance to deal with the poll off to the side of the screen. And Dean, uh, it's awesome to have you with us. Tell us a little bit about yourself and... Uh, and the stage is yours for the next 10 or so minutes. Well, thanks a lot, Rob, and thanks to the folks at AgVisor Pro. Uh, if you could pull this technologically off to get even me to get this new platform working, then uh, kudos and hats off. Great job. Like the rest of the panel, uh, I have a face made for radio, so I apologize to those folks in the, in the uh, audience, but I'm really excited about bringing you some key things that we think are important in Plant 21. 
And I, I guess I'm just going to hop right into it. Time's a bit of an issue with three good talkers, and Rob is maybe the best talker. Number one, it sounds academic, but it's really, really important, and I can't emphasize enough, is make sure you put your stretch target of gross margin, which translates into profitability, into paper. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be a 50-page report. It doesn't have to be um, some giant academic study. But it's important for you to know and understand your business enough to put that stretch target. We don't get high prices and high yields very often in our farming career. I always, I always say the learning curve on farming is, is, is a brutal one because uh, certainly for most of the growers north of the border and to a good chunk of our friends south of the border, we don't get, to, we don't get more than one chance to execute a crop a, seed a year. And so mistakes are, are right in our face for the next whole season until we get a chance to, to get a chance to redo. And so put your stretch target in place and so all of us have our dream all of us have our dream crop we have an 80 bushel canola at 16 bucks a bushel which produces a tremendous gross margin and i we know that's not going to be it has to be achievable but make it so that everything lines up from there we go and go to step the second most important thing we do in plant 21 is go purchase research learn understand talk to experts like travis and the folks in the insurance world buy our floor and what i mean when i say that is is that it's pretty daunting with the dollars invested in agriculture how much money we spend on on producing a crop and those with mother nature in the markets playing with our emotions constantly changing always looming and uh, the the balance of fear versus greed is 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 a is a constant balancing act inside of our inside of our brains and inside of our hearts and our stomachs and so in order to make sure we've mitigated so that fear doesn't drive us into bad decisions i want people to understand to talk to people like Travis Weens and buy our financial floor. So we know that if mother and the na mother nature and the markets decide that this is not our year and things come unglued or the wheels come off or unforeseen problems that we have a solid financial safety net available to us. Uh, now it's a little different based on each region, but the concept is absolutely paramount. And, and, and I'll tell you why that's that's important uh, for Rob and all the folks out there. The, the reason that's important is because no one ever measures the missed opportunities of not taking advantage of, uh, of not, no one measures missed opportunities that I should have sprayed this, or I should have put another 20 pounds in, or I should have, my should have list. And, what I don't want to do is have the fear of the unknown or the uncertainty or fear of failure outweigh those dreams of the stretch target so much so that when Mother Nature and the markets collide and give us a great opportunity, we don't take advantage of it. And trust me, I see those all the time, folks. I see it time and time again. And when you had all the cards fall in your favor and you achieved this when it was really achievable or, or the stage was set for you to achieve this, uh, th those snowball. Then you go into the next year with a little less liquidity and a little less equity and a little less confidence and, and it has a drastic effect. Whereas those people that had their stretch target set had their fear mitigated with a good solid financial insurance plan like the one from Global Ag or any of the other privates or crop insurance, ag stability and, and uh, a various amount of tools in, the, in 
to our friends in central Canada and our friends south of the border. People who take advantage and have then have l l Mother Nature and luck be your lady. It's, it's astounding the long-term impacts of that. And I see it in my business all the time. And so I can't emphasize that enough. Then once you've established that, last thing before is then put that out of your mind. Get that, get that floor gone. Go back to the stretch target and figure out who you need to put in place between your agronomy team and your marketing team to really attack to again, set the stage to make sure you take advantage of opportunities when they're presented in front of you. So Patrick or Rob, uh, I think that's probably my time limit. You let me know if I've got a couple more minutes I'd like to. Uh... So what you're saying, Dean, is the farmer is the captain of his ship. Am I, am I getting that right? The farmer is the captain of the ship. And that's a and fabulous. It's up to him to put together the crew, and it's up to him to make sure that the course is set. And you got to make sure that you got the downside covered, but you want to take advantage of the upside in case the wind is blowing and the sails are full. And that is a perfect summary. Don't let fear overrule us in the mid-season pressure. And so that is a that is a great summary. And thanks again to you and the. Fabulous folks at AgVisor Pro, Rob. Rob, we'll be back with you. We'll bring you back on here in a little while. The next uh, speaker that we have is Travis Weens. Sorry, is Derek Squire. And Derek and I go way back. And the one thing that a captain needs, like the captain of a farm, is you need somebody who's a good navigator, somebody who can read the tea leaves. And uh, this, uh, this ability to deal with the market is really quite something. You know, Derek, a while ago I was on the farm and uh, I unearthed the genie in the fall and I rubbed the lamp and the genie came out and I asked for a 15 buck canola and poof, it happened. And then in the springtime, I found the lamp behind the seat of the tractor and I rubbed it and the genie came out and said, what do you want for your second wish? I said, $15 canola. And he said, well, I did that before. And I said, yes, but this time I'm going to sell it. <laughs> so anyways, in all seriousness, there's a poll out right now in the poll area that deals with the topic you're going to talk about, Derek, which is really reading the markets and finding out what's going on. We've got some extraordinary things happening in the markets this year, and that's what you're going to talk about. So you're going to bring up three key things from a marketing standpoint that farmers need to pay attention to. So my friend, the stage is yours. All right, well, thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me on. So uh, so yeah, my first one of my th three things is make sure that you know what the market drivers are in the market. Yeah, there's, so there's, there's th you know, many different ones that are critical. Um, you know, one that's out there today is, is the, the Chinese swine flu. That is probably the biggest thing that's hitting the the airways right now, you know, and it's popped up a couple different times here in the last two or three weeks. Uh, it's something that's happened in 2018, so we have some some recent experience with that, and it really hurt the canola and the soybean market for a couple of years. And you know, their herds uh, were were diminished a lot, um, and they're really were really starting to to build those up again uh, just in the last last six to eight months, and and that really. Uh, got us to where we are today you know it's helping the feed side the feed barley prices are going higher corn's going higher soybeans are going higher and kind going higher for the meal and the protein involved in that so um you know now we're we're starting to hear more news that they may cut that you know cut their herds again so there's there's concern in the market so you know that's a it's a major piece to the puzzle going forward here and i'm going to talk about risk in a little bit so we're we're gonna i'll explain that and why it's important here soon so know your know the fundamentals um the other, the other piece of the, of the you know, major fundamental news is South America, of course. They grow a lot of beans and a lot of corn, and, and they're, they're in the middle of harvest right now. So, uh, uh, you know, Argentina has had a start, uh, you know, uh, kind of a slow start. There's a lot of dryness and um, different issues that they had there. So they probably got a little bit smaller crop. Brazil's got a, you know, had a pretty good year. They had a, you know, a lot of uh, wet rain throughout it, and and almost to the point where they've had too much rain now. So they're having some quality concerns, and 
Um, so there's, you know, there's different issues there that you got to be on top of. Um, weather in North America is we're starting off fairly dry in a lot of the southern Midwest uh, and right up into the northern tier states where a lot of the spring wheat and, and canola is grown in North Dakota and Montana and parts of South Dakota. So, um, you know, that's, there's, there's a lot of different fundamental news that's, that's out there today that you have to be on top of. The most important thing of all that is it changes every day. And so you can't, you know, there's, you know, I've done a few of these reports and, you know, I give a report and, and it changes in a week and, in, and you're looking at it two weeks later and you're going, okay, well, there's so much that has changed in the last two weeks. So you constantly got to stay on top of those things. And it's going to, you know, we're going to be in these weather markets all the way through the spring and summer, um, you know, in all these different, you know, these three different areas that I've been talking about are going to keep on changing, especially in North America. So we're going to see a lot of weather markets this year. So it's going to be something to, to really pay attention to this year. Um, the second thing is make a risk management plan. And what I mean by that is, is um, know your cost of production. You know, we can't start new marketing, know your cost of production, um, know what your return on investment is and, and, uh, and know what your cash reserves are. And, and ask yourself the question, how wrong can I afford to be? And it's similar to what Dean's saying and is, is, is uh, you, know, you know, protect your bottom. And, and, and that's really what this is about as well, is, is know what your risk tolerance is and make sure that you're making decisions to protect you on the bottom side. And then you can start making, you know, other decisions that, that are, are pushing the limits a little bit, but make sure that you've, you've got that risk management plan in place in case the markets do start to go, start to go down, or you know something fundamentally changes and your and the and the and the wind changes in Rob's analogy there that you know you start you know the market goes in different directions on you. Uh, the third thing um, is make a cash flow plan, and it's it's really what you need to know what bills need to be paid in September, October, November, and 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 what you know how much cash you need to to get you through to that time frame. There's there's a lots of history that shows us that seasonal trends go lower at harvest time. And, and so, uh, you know, when you want, you want to have enough cash and, and, you know, uh, you know, sell at good prices today to a lower risk, but make sure you have the cash flow to withstand, you know, that those lower, that market coming off a little bit, because typically the last part of the year, you're after Christmas or you get into January, February, March, demand starts kicking in. Uh, you and the market starts to go a little bit higher the last you know the last second you know the uh, there's there's a lot of product that comes into the uh, into the market at harvest time so the pipelines full the elevator pipelines full and they've got lots of supply uh, as that demand you know that pipeline uh, dwindles away and the you know, visible stocks dwindle away typically there you know there's tighter stocks and then there's more demand comes in the last half of the year and you want to be able to withstand that that change in market to wait for that demand to kick in the last part of the year so um so hopefully that covers off uh the three things and and uh and gives you a better idea of what's going to be crucial to success in, in 2021 and i'll ask rob to come on and introduce the next speaker yeah uh, Derek. before i let you go here um you know um one of the things that that you told us at the power farm meeting that we just had you speak at a while ago was if if a farmer can can get cash off the combine with it with with a decent return like this barley right now barley market if you can knock off five five plus dollars a bushel on barley off the combine and then hold those crops that are going to increase in value towards the uh, end of the, the the calendar or into the next fiscal year. It's a prudent strategy. So get your cash, but then sit on the crops that are going to rise. Can you just comment a little bit about that? Yeah. So yeah, that's that's part of you know knowing what the, the critical drivers are and what what things you know see say things that are going to affect the feed market or you know I, I feel that that's the most risk part of the market right now is is the, the feed side and it's and it's propping up a lot of commodities right now. So so my my comment in that is is protect yourself on downside risk. There's probably um, you know the, 
the, the, I feel the most risk in the feed side. We're already seeing some of that. Like there's been some rain through the Midwest in the last few days and you're seeing barley prices come down already. You're seeing feed wheat prices come down already. So, so I think that that's a good one to sell, get your cash flow. It's, it's probably near the top end of this, of the range. And so that's one to sell where canola uh, is, is, has potential soybeans, the same has potential for explosiveness that, that we're looking at tight S and D's near the end of the year. There's lots of demand. If if things stay the same as the ways we see them right now, there's very tight supply and demand for soybeans and very tight supply demand for canola, and that that turns into strong prices near the end of the year. And and so that's where you sell your feeds to, to create that cash flow and hold your canola to the end of the year, so you can have that explosiveness and and uh, and capitalize on it. You know, I got this cap. I got this cap sitting there. It's a Trefline Rape Yield 30, uh, Derek. And in our career, we've seen target yields go from 30 bushels of canola to as high as 100 with the Canola 100 contest. And what we've learned over time is that uh, generally, uh, those farmers that put out the inputs and, and go after the yield are able to drop their unit cost of production. And we had Elston Solberg talking about aggressive agronomy this year. Jeff, I think it was Jeff Nielsen said, well, what about sacrificing uh, the rotation? Well, you got to do things agronomically. However, this might be a good year to push the agronomy fairly hard, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You know, that's, um, there's lots of, uh, you, know, you know, go where the money is this year, right? So, you know, we capitalize it on, on a year like this when prices are high. Yeah, that's where you, you kind of get your base and then swing for the fences. Right on. Well, we're going to bring up our next speaker now. Thank you, Derek. Speaking of uh, inputs and speaking of risk mitigation, global ag risk, uh, back in my agri-trend days when um, Grant was starting global ag risk, one of the key factors that they determined was those farmers that, that do a good job of allocating the inputs. In other words, making that decision on the fungicide generally were lower risk. However, you still have to lay out the cash. So, so Travis, I want you to talk about how to mitigate risk in the terms of a crop year and maybe how to merge together government and private insurance together. So my friend, the stage is yours for the next three hints. Or maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Was, uh, like, Travis, is Travis coming back on? I don't know. It seems like he's frozen right now. So uh, well, the internet in Milestone doesn't work great. Uh, it's just like the overhead sewers in Milestone, overhead glass sewers in Milestone, Rob. They're uh, they're a little suspect. You know, this brings up a point that I wanted to talk about a lot, and that is, you can't have a smart farm with a stupid internet connection. And so, one of the things I've been pressuring in the speeches I've been given, especially to the government is that internet, a rural broadband coverage is as important as roads and bridges. And so here's Travis, he came back. So Travis, one of the things I wanted you to talk about was if farmers are gonna get aggressive with their inputs and go after the, the yields they wanna capture, how can they mitigate the risk and use both uh, private and public insurance together? How can we make that happen? And the stage, my friend, is you Awesome. Well, that pretty much sums up 2020, doesn't it? And 2021, as we're all living in a world of Zoom calls these days. So as Rob mentioned, I'm an agronomist by trade. And so I'm used to giving advice on going for it. And today I'm in the role of the what if guy. Uh, Derek mentioned the market should have some legs, but be cautious. Dean says, just go for it. And I'm here to help you manage through the what if something goes wrong. So if you're looking out the window today and it's dry wherever you are, I know it is really dry here, or you're concerned that what if these markets don't hang on and prices drop, you're in the right place. So I wanna talk about um, first off the process that I go through and that GARS advisors go through. And somebody at GARS is gonna kill me, but I'm gonna say this, 
my role is to be an insurance advisor. My job is not to sell you GARS. My role is to help you create a risk management plan and help you understand your options that are out there. Much like we get a balance of fertilizer, I look at your insurance dollars in the same manner. It is not GARS or SCIC or your provincial crop insurance per se. It is how do you manage the risk on your farm with the budget that you have for insurance dollars. So to Dean's point, what is a good risk management plan? We heard Derek defying what he thinks a risk management plan is. And I would simply say a good risk management plan is knowing what is your worst case scenario that you are comfortable with and that your stakeholders are comfortable with. So then how do we get to that point? First step, do a risk assessment. When we're talking about production risk here right now only, what are the factors that are at risk on your farm? So I'm on the Regina Plains. We are primarily Durham, Lentils, Canola. So our big risks generally are Fusarium and can be Lentils. disease. So we also grow things that are on. And I think I'm back. Sorry. So back to what's in a risk assessment. So figure out what your risks are. And then second, know your options. What's out there for tools that you can use to protect your downside risk. So get quotes from everybody. Get quotes from SCIC, or your provincial insurance. Get quotes from the other private insurance companies and then get some advice. We have the ability to sit down and go through the process with you and your stakeholders. And I keep mentioning that because that's important. You're not in this alone. I know you might be alone in the tractor or the sprayer in your truck making a lot of the decisions, but you have to keep in mind there's other people involved in your operation that your decisions have bearing on and they're also feeling potentially the pressure of the situation that you might be in on any given day. I know we had lots of growers here last year watching clouds go by, wondering how much more money do I put into this crop until it finally started to rain. So how do I get to know my worst case when there's so many variables? GARS, and it's not gonna be a GARS commercial, but I'm gonna help you understand where I'm coming from. So GARS ensures the variables that affect profitability. So we're not just yield insurance like the privates or by, like the uh, government insurances are or some other privates that are dressed up to be profit insurance but really are just yield insurance. We are insuring your gross margin. And Dean didn't get into it a whole bunch, but gross margin pays for everything else on your farm. So we're gonna cover everything that affects price, yield, and your input costs. This year, as Dean mentioned also, huge opportunity to focus on profit. And we really want customers to do that. This is the year that has the opportunity to make generational wealth, I would argue in some parts of uh, our province or even in Western Canada. And while we're not telling you go sell your whole crop today, my goal is to make sure that you never say, I don't want to sell it because I haven't grown it yet. We want you to have the courage to go out and sell your production when the market is calling for it. GARS covers off your marketing losses and this is stuff that we can talk about offline when we have an Eggvisor Pro session, but this is important. I see a question in the chat on the Act of God. Act of God is simply more insurance. So I would encourage guys to look at, can we fund that Act of God yourself? Is there better ways to do that? And we've done that in the past using GARS or using even SCIC contracts. Lastly, where does egg stab fit into this and what do the new rules look like? So in my nine or 10 years with GARS, we've seen several changes to egg stability. Big one last year was that private insurance proceeds no longer go against your egg stability claim. So 
previously, if Ag Stability had owed you a million dollars and you got $500,000 from a private insurance, it would come off your Ag Stability settlement to some shape or form. So in conclusion, do a risk assessment, know what your options are, learn what your worst case scenario is and have your team agree that we can all live with that. Know what you're buying for insurance and why you're buying it and get advice on that. And then just go out and farm and market your grain the way you want to. Thanks, Rob. Well, thanks, Travis. I, you know, I put on my Robin Hood hat here because, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we we did a lot of good in the last number of years. Uh, it was a couple of years ago that we were addressing the uh, all of the deputy ministers of agriculture in Canada, and we really were like Robin Hood against uh, Prince John in that we were trying to get them to understand that if a farmer buys private. Uh, risk insurance and gets a payout, that income should not be detrimental against the government programs. And I don't know where we're at exactly in the US, but in Canada, this combination of having access to both really should create some merry men. Ha, <laughs> merry gets, yeah, forget it. Anyways, poor humor. But uh, Travis, one of the things that, that I have experienced in my lifetime running agricultural companies is that we as agriculture companies serving the farmers really can't get any insurance. Uh, farms these days, uh, the, the numbers are big, uh, granted, but when the stars align, and in my whole career, I have never seen the kind of contribution margins that are coming forward right now in the partial budget analysis anywhere from 350 to 500 to north of $500 per acre contribution margins and this really is a time for farmers to slow down a little bit piece the pieces together and make sure they have confidence like has been said protect the floor but give yourself the confidence to go after it um, you know uh, given your particular area any comments on that yeah i think uh, it's an exciting time it's been a lot of fun sitting down at kitchen tables or on zoom calls and looking at what the potential is this year on these farms. And it is really exciting to have the chance to hit a home run. And it, it's teed up for us, it's teed up for growers. And I think if we can all execute on the agronomic side and on the marketing side, I think we're set up for a fantastic year. Yeah, um, and, and any farmer can download the AgVisor Pro app for free. And by simply typing in Global Ag Risk or Travis Wings, bang, you're in a conversation with Travis. So it's free. So AgVisor Pro creates the connectivity. I wanna invite both Derek and uh, Dean to come back to the stage. And we're gonna go through a little bit of Q&A here. If you guys have got some questions, pop them into the question area. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start off by lobbing one out there and, uh, and, and, and really, um, how, uh, Dean, how, how stuck do we get farming the same way, not thinking about the options that have been presented here today? What kind of paradigm stretch do we need to do in a year like this? Well, and it's generationally, it's built on us, Rob. Uh, we have clients who live, some of our older clients who had lived through the 1930s and they remember having no food in the fridge or no food in the cupboards and and they remember being hungry and if you if you put 10 million dollars in their bank account it doesn't matter they worry about running out of money to run out of food because that's ingrained in their it's in it's in their dna now because they lived through those events if you take farmers who live through massive droughts if you take farmers who live through massive frosts event, those those are those those alter our psyche in the crop and those major hailstorms events, they all play on our fear that it can happen to us again. But as a result, those decisions that we make in those as a result of those years cost us good profit for the next ten after that. 
And, and so that's really when you talk about playing with confidence, it's like a goalie or a quarterback who has the confidence of the coach and is allowed to make mistakes but go for it. It, it, it's different and you can't measure it. It's not mathematical, Rob, but we see farms that have, that have been properly uh, had that confidence instilled with their insurance program. And, and it's not that their claims are higher in future years. It's that they grow their way out of it and put big bottom line to it. So, so it's, it's, it's hard, but it's, it's generational wealth. Is the is the net result and impact? The, uh, the the thing too is, I mean, we've got a lot of farmers from all over North America and even Belgium on this particular session here, and maybe a lot of you guys are saying, "Yeah, uh, uh, all hat, no cows." In other words, uh, all of us came from farms, but reality, you guys as farmers are the players. However, again, this type of scenario, Derek, hasn't come uh, around very often. Uh, normally, we get a freak that creates a market rush, but to be entering into a spring planting season that where the guys can actually, uh, the guys and gals can actually lock in a profit is pretty rare situation. And how many times have you actually seen that? Right. So you're, yeah, you're right. Typically, we see a production problem someplace in the world, and and we see the markets take off. In, in the selling season and and it kind of ramps up through the selling season. You know, and that we've seen this this last year, that was production problems and in, in, there's some problems in, in the US and, and parts of China. Um, and, and, but this year we're going in, in, you know, where we're going in where supply and demand looks tight again for next year, that there's enough demand that is carrying over into next year, on, especially on oil seeds, um, and the meal side, you know, those, those, both of those are very strong. Wheat is a little bit different, so you got to manage that. You know, the, the feed side as we talked about, but, but no, never, never seen it carry over two years in a row. If you look at the charts in the history of the charts, it's typically a six to nine month curve, and and we ramp up and we come right back down again. So that, you know, so, so you never want to say never and you never want to say, well, you know, this is the first time it's going to carry over. So you got to be very, that's where we're talking about managing risk and, and, you know, fundamentally changes and things like that. So we've got to be careful of that, but it does look very strong going into this next year again for tightness and, and continued demand in a, in a changing market. So, so yeah, first time in my career that we're seeing these kind of prices carry over into the next year. So manage it with caution. Um, but, but it, it uh, you know, it, and like I said, stay on top of the fundamentals and, and you should be fine uh, na navigating all that. So Derek, when you were, when you were speaking to us, a lot of the stocks use ratios were down to the single digits. That's a rare thing when stocks use ratios get down to st single digits. And there's several commodities that are, are looking at like that right now. You got to unmute, Derek. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. So, um, so yeah, um, yeah. The biggest change is, uh, you know, the stock is soybeans, and and we were at, you know, with with China, uh, Chinese U.S. trade wars, we were up around twenty seven percent stocks to use ratios, which is very high. We had, you know, a lot of big carryouts in in U.S. soybeans, which turns into, uh, you know, canola follows that very closely. So. Uh, now we're we're talking about three percent stocks to use ratio. So we've gone from twenty seven down to three in about a year and a half. And it's it's Chinese demand. It's some you know some problems with some soybean production in the U.S. Combination of a couple of things. But yeah, we're down to three percent stocks to use ratio. When, when I talk stocks to use ratio, it is you know that's you know the carry out in the bin that you know the percent that you're going to use of the next year's demand you know so three percent is nothing like it's where we're, there is some rumors that the u.s may have to import some soybeans from south america to satisfy some of the sales they've got already so i mean that's how tight things are canola is very similar to that we're going to get down to below 600,000 tons you know we originally were projecting about 10% stocks to use ratios with about 1.9 million metric tons, but now we're talking um, three or four percent. So it's it's down very very tight to to you know for any kind of product to be left in the bins. Right, Travis. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Dean. Rob, I just wanted to uh, 
talk, talk to the question that Jeff Nielsen posted on the question panel. Okay. Uh, and Jeff, and Jeff, I'm glad you brought that up. That's very important. That's why when I talked about it, and I'll, I'll maybe hand it off to Travis because he might know a what, thing or two about agronomy. Just repeat the question. The question so is, know. explain, stick to a rotation. Uh, it says, follow other countries, question mark. Explain, stick to a rotation here for soil health. You may lose on one crop, yet gain on the other, but it's the soil, it's the soil one needs to pay attention to. And, and so, Jeff, you're absolutely right. When we're putting our stretch targets and our aggressive uh, yield or crop plans in place, the agronomist, which Rob and Travis have forgot more than I've ever known about agronomy, uh, they're they're the kingpin in the room as far as not not hurting the soil for the long term. But within the parameters, you, you, you still need to push for the profitability. So, uh, Travis, maybe speak to that as far. Uh, yeah, just, yeah. There's there's some risks in what uh, in pushing a rotation, particularly in the in the legume crops like peas and, um, but but there's also some wiggle room to stretch some acres around without punitively damaging your rotation long term or hurting your. Um, uh, or hurting your, your yield or your crop potential in subsequent years. Travis, as I move over to you, I wanted to just tee up the ball for you because at private insurance, even though, you know, you, GARS has been around for a while, is still relatively new for, for most producers. They haven't experimented with the layering of private and government insurance together. Comments about that and, and agronomy, if you want to give her. Sure. Well, a couple things on the economic question. Let's park that one for a second um, to the point where if you do gross margin analysis right now, it doesn't really matter what crop you pick. As we're sitting down doing these plans with growers, we're looking at gross margin on every crop and there's a 30 to $60 an acre spread. Like there's not really one crop yelling, grow me. And there's not really one crop yelling, don't grow me. So just, look at the gross margins of every crop and i i haven't seen a lot of tweaking of rotations in the last three months as we go through this whole process um in terms of stacking of the private insurance um, there's a comment on there that egg stability sucks um granted it's not as good as what it used to be but we've got a tool where we can actually tell you where your insurances start to pay out and in many cases where where we are Egg stability is actually one of the first ones to pay. So egg stability in conjunction with a GARS policy or private insurance policy, you get that additive effect compared to crop insurance. You might get a big check from crop insurance, but it is not a guarantee of profitability because whatever you get from crop insurance is potentially and most likely coming right out of what you would have got from egg stability anyway. And this is the part I think that farmers just need to, to understand, go through the process of getting a GARS quote, spending some time with a GARS advisor or somebody on Dean's team and get some understanding of how these programs actually work together. So Dean, you've actually been fairly defensive of ag of, uh, of agri-stability in the last uh, few uh, sessions that I've seen you speak at, and, and particular in, in favor of this tweak where they're not punitively uh, penalizing income from private, private uh, insurance schemes. Can you talk about that, Dean? Yeah, Rob, and, I, and I'm a, always a fiscal conservative, so I struggle with taxpayers uh, putting in programs like egg stability. But for sure, from a grower perspective and from uh, a grower advisor perspective, it really is a no-brainer. And the only one who, the only way to not, to be better off then getting an egg stability claim is outgrowing your egg stability margins. And, and it works, the enhancements are really powerful to, to build a great base because you can double insure to make sure that there's no holes in your safety net. And I, I don't know if that, if I explained that well enough, we're, we're limited for time here, Rob, but, but the only person this is negative for is the taxpayer because for, for a really cost-effective marriage between egg stability, which is heavily government subsidized, and global egg, which fills up any gaps, you can pr provide a, a rock solid bottom 
on your farm to let you uh, just set it and go forward? So if we were to um, map out uh, that strategy, Derek, on cash flow, uh, figuring out, the, so I've seen before where, where guys will try to chase a market to try to get a high price, but in the meantime, squeeze themselves cash wise. So can you just chat a little bit about some of the tools you use or this, you know, some of this is fairly cowboy math, but some of it's pretty sophisticated in terms of matching these two things together. And uh, can you just comment on that and maybe a little bit around risk mitigation of holding inventory in the bin versus paper? Just uh, comment on that, Derek. Yeah. So, so yeah. So if you, you've got cash uh, that you know that you uh, you need to. Don't pay a big land payment or a combine payment, um, and it, you know what we do is we try to create cash with with selling the the, the commodity and, and stay in the market by buying futures or options. So, uh, you know both are good tools. Options are are a lot less risky. Uh, they're you know they allow you to stay in the market in through fluctuations and and ride out uh, of you know some dips in the market. There's no margin calls that sort of thing. With paper, it's just like having it in the bin. Uh, with with futures paper, I mean, it's just like having it in the bin. Uh, you know, you you have margins calls on those fluctuations, but it allows you, like Rob said, to to cash and, and uh, you know you sell your cash and stay in the market uh, for for longer terms, um, as long as you you know just make sure you have the right tools there um, to that you're you're comfortable with, and if you know. Make sure that you've got some advisors helping with that, just because it's it becomes it can become very um, technical. You know, there's lots of um, technical jargon that comes in there. You, you know, the charts and the in the in the graphs, and and you know, there's a lot of uh, big moves with fund companies that are pushing the market higher and lower. Maybe the the cash prices are staying high, and in, in uh, but big, but futures are jumping around. So make sure you're you're well advised on that or, or have the experience and education to uh, to do it properly. Yeah, thanks, Derek. I have to say hi to Skip Kleinfelter in Illinois and uh, Matt Ramage in Kentucky. These are people that I know, and uh, it's really great to have you guys on. I'm just looking, Dean, right now, and Jeff Nielsen again said something about maybe backing off on CPFs wheat and moving more towards that cash price off the combine on barley, but again, I'm looking right now at the work we did on partial budget analysis right now. This is far, farmer input right now. And you know, we're looking at uh, uh, even for modest wheat yields, uh, 240 in terms of a gross margin. This is yield times price minus seed fertilizer, chemical and crop insurance. We're seeing, uh, you know, yellow peas looking really, really good and um, yeah, even IP oats and canola looking at around 400 to 450 in terms of contribution margins. So that's looking pretty good. Dean, if you were uh, uh, a young farmer today, somebody who is just starting out in their career, heavily leveraged, and uh, and yet again, it, you know, I, my hair is fairly silver. You don't see these kind of years come along very often. What what would what advice would you give a younger farmer who's looking at this scenario, not to make them whacked out crazy, but just to give them, what would, what would be your advice? Well, uh, uh, the problem is, Rob, is we've been complacent, and you and Travis would know and understand that our yield curve is moving up faster than than young Rob and young Travis would have ever even imagined that, that it would move. And if there's a year where I want to capture those, the yield potential that my land has given me, it's years where there's a good opportunity to price it. And, and so I'd actually wouldn't use Derek. Derek comes from a history of grain marketing where he's been, he's been used with two hats. He's been a risk mitigator and an opportunity taker. I'd take his risk mitigator hat off and I'd say, let's go, let's go gunslinger to try to do with those fundamentals that he talks about, understanding that and pursue pursue top line profit. 
I'd put the I so I'd put the gunslinger shoot for the moon hat on Derek. I'd put the gunslinger shoot for the moon hat on uh what's your what's your the young fellow you work with, Elston Solberg, might know a bit about the plant here and there. I'd put my gunslinger reach for the shoot for the moon target on him. And I'd put my chicken shit banker accountant risk mitigator hat on Travis. Speaking speaking of banks, Dean, uh, we talked about this as well. Um, there's been a bit of shift in attitude of the banks towards farmers, a bit of a shift. Can you comment on what you're seeing there with respect to the banks, their philosophy, maybe a bit of shift in attitude? Uh, it, it, explain the shift. It, 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 give me a context, Rob. Well, in, in, in that, they're, they're, they're more willing to take into account land as well. Yeah, and, and that's why I'm glad you brought up the young farmer because the old rich farmers have a big bucket of equity in land as mm -hmm. a backstop. Whereas the young, even if you're a young aggressive farm who, is, who owns a fair bit of land for someone your age, typically you manage far more acres than, the, than you own. And, and that's where the risk mitigation plan is paramount, things like egg stability combined with other insurances. Uh, those those floors are absolutely nece necessary to be able to survive because there's not the land equity hiccup there's not the land equity to fall back on dean colin smith asks the question about renting additional acres are we not better uh, are we not better to do a better job on acres we control consistently rather than trying to chase short-term land that's an interesting question it, it deals with uh, um, you know spreading out your uh, uh, fixed costs uh, like a machinery uh, but also it stretches your ability if you don't have enough uh, lines of credit to do a good job agronomically so Colin just brought that up I think that's an interesting uh, uh, take just maybe comment on that a little bit uh, uh, well Travis what do you think of that should the guys chase additional acres or what do you think they should do on a year like this Acres are hard to come by in our part of the world, so we're not real familiar with uh, with some of that. But I, I would lean generally to let's do better on what we have. Um, these prices aren't going to last forever. And Western Canadian farmers have been successful because we're traditionally low-cost producers. And we keep seeing the trend towards farms getting bigger and more efficient, and that's going to continue. Um, but at the same time, focus on that management piece. Um, I didn't talk about it, but besides knowing your worst case scenario, you should also figure out what does 5% more yield or 5% more um, better pricing, pardon my poor English, but if you can sell for 5% better, what does that do to your bottom line? Yeah. Glad yeah, my two, yeah. My two Glad cents on Colin is 100% agree with Colin. Be great, then be big. Like big's okay, but if you make me choose between a big farm and a great farm, I always choose a great farm. So uh, on the Gar side, a couple of comments back and forth. Uh, Gars give pre uh, protection against uh, seed fertilizer and chemical, but uh, Derek, uh, Glenn was talking about uh, contract buyout. If you don't have production, how do you deal with the downside risk if you don't have uh, the production that you were thinking you were going to have, and yet, and, and what would you recommend for percentage of crops sold in a year like this with the aggressive pricing? So, to answer the first question, uh, uh, first, um, global egg risk scars will will protect you on on contract buyout. So, so there is there is a portion in there, and it allows you if you have a GARS policy to it that allows you to be a more aggressive seller. Um, so, so if you don't have that product, you know, a dry year or hail or something that, that gets you from left field, then, then, then you have, you know, if you're in a claim situation, then, then that, then you get, you know, the, the cost of that buyout kicks in for you within GARS. So, so the answer to the second question, do you want to go yeah. ahead? Go ahead. So answer the second question is, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you know, 
be percent sold on what you need for cash. So I think that's the, the, the first thing is, is uh, depending on how many dollars you need for that September to November 30th time frame, um, you know, add up how many dollars you need in there and then start making decisions around that and, and stick to, you know, what I said earlier about the feed pricing and, and maybe all those percentages up a little bit and things that you think that are going to be more explosive later in the year, hang on to those, but make sure your dollars are covered off. Good. Listen, there's a lot of great questions. Kelly Cole has got questions here. Dale Ganash has got questions. Dennis Kirk. I want to be conscious of our hour long uh, session here. This is our first session. Uh, to all of those people who have uh, questions, let me remind you again that AgVisor Pro, the app you can download, you can talk to any of these companies that are represented on the screen for free. You simply download AgVisor Pro and you bring it up. So in kind of in wrap up, I want to uh, let you guys know that these were the three uh, key targets that Dean Klippenstein brought forward. Define your dream, set them high, uh, buy to protect your downside, then forget it. So set your upside, know what that's going to be, protect your downside. And then in the words of Elston, maybe some assertive agronomy to hit the dream target. Uh, Derek Squire says, know what drives the market. Pay attention, it changes all the time. U.S. moisture, South American harvest or planting, swine flu, etc. Have a solid risk management plan in place. And lastly, have a cash flow plan to know how you could hold the crops that is escalate. And to use the word uh, that Derek used, there's potential for some explosion in the market in the latter part of the uh, well, into next year, but you've got to be able to hold on that crop and, and essentially keep paper, keep the crop. And then Travis says, get different quotes and know your worst case scenario and know how to layer in the government programs tied together with the private insurance programs. As we wind up, I just want to bring up the last slide here and just Derek, if you can make a couple comments, then Dean and Travis, and we'll call it a, a night. Derek? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it is a, it is a extra extraordinary uh, uh, year uh, that we're going to come into. So so uh, you know I agree with a lot of you know all the speakers here today that that you know, Dean said that that yeah if you've got your 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 bottom end covered with a GARS policy then yeah you can swing for the fences in a marketing plan and and if you have that covered on on a GARS platform you can swing for the fences on the agronomy so it's all a matter of where you put that risk management um, doesn't have to be in a in a marketing plan and you know if, if different areas you want to manage differently so um, you know if you're if if, uh, if you feel that your risk your risk is covered off in other areas then yeah be more aggressive on your marketing plan, but but know what, you know what, know, stay on top of the markets. Good, and any of you, any of you people attending this uh, seminar, if you can go to the polls and just fill out what you, what you perceive in the polls, there's three different questions and that sort of thing. Dean, and then Travis. Dean, a comment as we wrap up. Yeah, well, uh, at M&P, we're so smart, Rob, we did a 600 page analysis and determined that $16 canola is more profitable than $10 canola. So uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to read that report, uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to send it to them. But no, these, these, these co collisions don't come along very often in our lifetime. And I can't emphasize enough, I'd like people to take advantage of it uh, to reward the hard work and effort they do every year to uh, have these opportunities in front of them. Great, Travis. Sure, uh, Dean and I are both products of the '80s, so you talk about some of those lingering effects that affect your where you end up in life, and uh, to see the opportunity that exists in agriculture right now, one can't help but be excited um, for for the farmers that are out there today and the whole industry as a whole, and it's a, a great time to be in agriculture. I bought my land in 81, so I signed uh, off on mortgages at 18% and missed the peak of the land prices by about a month. So uh, I know that feeling and how that ingrains. On the screen right now, everyone, are some of the companies, or are the companies that are available on AgVisor Pro as TechDirect. We have a number of startup companies and, of course, um, Gars uh, and uh, MNP and Exceed uh, Grain Marketing are all here. All of these companies uh, are available for free. We'll be sending you guys out right after this a link to our uh, uh, our application that you can download for free. 
And if you schedule a session with any one of these companies that are on the screen right now within the next three hours, again, just schedule a session. It's free. Uh, you can talk to Hammond Realty about farmland prices. Chris Patterson asked a question about that. Uh, you can talk to either Taurus or you can talk to Top Crop or ATP Nutrition or CanGrow about fertilizers. So there's lots of companies here. We're just getting started. Our next webinar will be March 31st where we're going to de go deep into some of the planting considerations necessary to have good emergence on your crop. So until then, take care. We uh, love uh, bringing these together for you. And uh, the uh, download sessions are now available in the app so you can download now. Thank you very much. We'll see you on March 31st. That I will end the event. Have a good day. Thanks, guys.